Kristen Baldwin from Entertainment Weekly, and I'm hosting today's In Creative Company conversation featuring the women of Made. With us today from Netflix's critically acclaimed limited series are showrunner, EP, and writer Molly Smith Metzler, actress Margaret Qualley, who plays Alex, actress Andy McDowell, who plays Paula, actress Anika Noni Rose, who plays Regina, director of photography Kui Ann Q Tran, who also directed episode eight, Bear Hunt composer S.T. Haim, and Lila Neugebauer, who directs episode five, Thief. Thank you guys all so much for joining us. It's great to have you here. Great to be Thank here. You. Thank you. So Made is, of course, inspired by the New York Times bestselling memoir, Made, Hard Work, Low Pay, and a Mother's Will to Survive by Stephanie Land. And it follows the story of Alex, a single mother who turns to house cleaning who turns to house cleaning to barely make ends meet as she escapes an abusive relationship. And as we can see from this incredible panel, much of the talent who helped create this show, both on screen and behind the scenes, are women. Molly, as a showrunner, talk about the importance of having a largely female team and how it benefited the overall craft of the show from your perspective. Well, I'm so excited that we have such a largely female team, but with a show like this, where we spend 10 hours inside the heart and brain of one woman, her quality never leaves the screen. She's always on screen. And so because of that, it really, it's a, it's told through a female lens. You know, Stephanie is a woman. I'm a woman. We're all women. But it was so important to, and to get that, that feeling right, you know, that women know how to tell the story of other women and how to take us inside the brain and heart. And she used a little example. There's a moment in episode eight with our directors here um, where the couch gobbles Alex up. Um, and just the number of women that have said to me, oh my God, I've been in that couch. You know, that, it, that I do think a collective of women know how to dramatize a story like this in a, in a way that's very personal. Yes, and I definitely want to talk more about that couch moment later because it got me too, but um, Q and Lila, you know, more than half the episodes are directed by women. And I would love to hear just if you want to add how your innate understanding of the female point of view would aid you when you were directing Made, which is, of course, as uh, she said, told from a, a woman's perspective. From a cinematographer, I mean, I, I think they're all combined. Um, being a cinematographer and a director on the show was really a blessing because because I am a woman, because I am a mother, because I have a daughter, and because I have a mother, I, I really think that that really has helped um, tell the perspective because so much of the camera work is subjective. And Molly and I were very, very strict about the rules that we set um, when it came to portraying Alex's character and how physically the camera was right there with Margaret and I know that was like technically at times very difficult because shooting large format, you, your, your depth of field and your field of view is, is so expanded and it creates an intimacy, which is very different from other formats. And so a lot of times, like, I'd be like, Margaret, are you okay if I put the camera right here? <laughs> like <laughs> literally like 12 inches from your face, you know, I, I want you to be able to connect with the other characters in the scene. But at the same time, the camera really needs to be here to be with you. And she'd be like, yeah, let's do it. Let's get cute. Let's go. Let's go. And I, and that's why I love this collaboration was really um, to put forth the most compelling narrative. Lila, anything you'd like to add to that? You know, I guess um, I've only ever been a woman. So um, uh, to an extent, I suspect there are levels at which um, uh, I, perhaps can't totally parse the ways in which my experience of the world um, by virtue of being a woman likely inform every single point of view I have. <laughs> yeah. Even though when I show up to set, I think of myself as a director, um, period. Um, uh, that said, I think that um, the gift of uh, being in a collaboration with other women's voices um, uh, can allow a kind of built-in shared vocabulary vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, a, a relationship to certain structures, power structures, um, uh, a certain awareness about the way that uh, certain, um, uh, certain perceptions of the way that women's stories are told 
Margaret, so it was your idea to have your real life mother, Andy McDowell, play Alex's mom, Paula, on screen. Um, was that part of why you wanted to do this role or how did that idea spark for you? Um, that came later. I, um, I wanted to do this role because it was like nothing I'd ever read and it seemed super hard and I wanted the challenge and I was incredibly touched and moved by both the script and Stephanie's memoir. Um, and then I got lucky and I got the part and um, I was up in Canada quarantining and the role of uh, Paula was, was still open. And then it dawned on me that um, no one would be better at it than my own mother. Um, I, I always wanted to work with her one day and I was kind of like, you know, one day once I like, one day I'll read something that just has like a incredibly complicated, interesting relationship between a mother and a daughter and, or uh, I guess I didn't even have to be mother and daughter, but that would be ideal. Anyhow. Um, and I'll work with her then. And, um, and then I, but I, I can be like, kind of like a, like a hoarder with things that are nice. You know what I mean? Like I, if I have like a nice soap, I'll like leave it on the shelf for 10 years before I use it. Um, I'm using other soap, um, but, but you know what I'm getting at? Yeah. And this felt like, like a nice soap that I was saving. And then we were in the middle of this pandemic. And I think that it reminded people, uh, for, for me, there was two things that I really brought to the forefront, which is that like family matters so much, your friends and your family, like the family you create or, or whatever, the, the people in your lives that are important to you really are so important. And, and then also just like, if you want to do something, you should just do it because who knows how long anyone has to do anything. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I decided not to save the soap. And I then <laughs> asked my mom if she would do this part with me. And I pitched it to Molly and she loved the idea. And luckily my mom said yes, because it would have been very embarrassing if she had said no. And uh, <laughs> all of that happened. So Andy, as the nice soap, um, how would you describe <laughs> your reaction as a mom and just as an actress upon hearing that, you know, your daughter wanted you for this very key, but also, you know, complicated role. I was pleasantly surprised because I, I, I know how independent my daughter is and it was really important for her to forge her own road. And uh, I thought we might eventually work together, but I didn't think- We're girls out here. <laughs> what did you say, sweetie? What? You pat fun of you, I love you, sorry, keep going. <laughs> okay. But I'm um, gonna take a bath. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I was pleasantly surprised because I was, it was unexpected and, um, that before I even knew anything, I knew I was going to do it. I mean, well, plus I, you know, I was a big fan of Shameless and, um, I was just so fired up. I couldn't wait to read it. And the greatest gift was I've always wanted to play a character that struggles with some kind of mental instability because I grew up with so much of it around me. And I know the nuances of what what it, it is to be, they say bipolar now, but they used to say manic depressive. It's something that I know firsthand. And when I read the script and saw the character, I was floored because it was a fantasy of mine. I never thought it was something that would ever happen. I thought I would never have this opportunity and that it was coming from my daughter blew my mind. So, uh, you know, I was just thrilled. I can't tell you. And Anika, you play Regina, a wealthy woman who Alex works for as a housekeeper. And I read that you only had one script when you began production. What were your initial impressions of Regina and how did that change over the course of the season? Oh, well, I guess I'm a little twisted because I loved her. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I read the script and I was like, this script is phenomenal. Um, this writing is fantastic. It was the best writing that I had gotten through my email in some time. Um, so I was really excited to step into her. And I'm always a little interested in women who aren't interested in being nice. Um, because I feel like 
we spend so much time trying to be nice, like to the detriment of ourselves. And when I say that, I, I don't think anybody here would be like, well, she's not really a nice person, so I don't know. You know, I, I think it's the difference between being nice and being kind. I'm, I am big on kindness. Um, I think that sometimes niceness takes us out of what is best for ourselves. Um, this woman was neither nice nor kind <laughs> when, <laughs> when we meet her. <laughs> so, so that was interesting to me and an interesting place to step into. But it was also interesting for me to play this very moneyed, very entitled um, black woman in a world where you see one other black person and not have to talk about blackness, not have to step into the space of race, not have anybody else have that conversation, but just be allowed to be in that place. So there were a lot of things, it, you know, including her, I didn't know at the time when I stepped into it that she was dealing with infertility. I just knew that she was going to be adopting a baby. And I thought, well, that's a great thing to talk about because so many women, particularly professional women, do that. And then it went far, far left. Um, and it did so in a stunning manner. Um, you know, that was a script I wasn't expecting and it was um, mind blowing to me. So I think I've answered the quest yeah. question. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's great. Um, and Esti, I want to talk to your contribution. You're obviously oh. an insanely accomplished musician, but this is your first time composing for a series. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us about making that transition and what the biggest challenge was for you as you kind of approached each episode? Um, well, I, like you said, I'm in a band with my two sisters and it's, you know, I, I, I can't say enough about how much fun I have making music and especially with my family. Um, but I'd always been a really big fan of, of composers, particularly Ludwig Goranson, who happened to produce our first EP. And I'd, I'd seen him throughout the years kind of just composing and coming over to his house. And when we would work with him, he would be like in the midst of composing all these things. And I think that was kind of my, my first sort of, taste of what that looked like or what it you know what it the job was you know um because it really doesn't feel like a job honestly it's so nice to um just kind of be able to contribute to something on a screen and not have there be you know the pressure of lyrics and you know i i really i really loved being able to look at something on a screen and and try and add to the emotional complexity of the show um and you know and every day you know was a journey with the show i felt like i was just such a big fan every every episode i'd be like i was like you know i had like a, a hankering for the next episode and i think if anything that was i was i was like wow like after watching the pilot and, and doing the pilot, I was like, wow, I feel like I'm, I'm part of something that's really powerful. And so I feel so honored to have been a part of, of this and having this having been my kind of first uh, foyer into composing. Um, again, I just feel so honored to, to have been able to do that. And I wanted, you know, I think that made was kind of my gateway drug. I'm so now it's like the thing that I think about all the time is like, is composing and so I if anything I have to you know thank the creators and, and everyone who's a, a part of the show for we're you know taking a chance on me and now it's it's really changed my life it's like something that I really want to do and continue to do so he's like a literal rock star and I remember <laughs> <laughs> literal rock star and I remember like um, Brett Headlam from Lucky Jack was, I think, the person that came up with the idea for us to do this. And I was like, that has to happen. That would be so cool. And then, <laughs> and, and then when she agreed to do it, I was like, what the hell? Like, how did we con her into this? Like, this is the greatest <laughs> thing. Ever. 
and I'm so glad that people like the show because I would have been like, I, I felt like I like tricked, like we tricked her into doing it or something. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, even, I mean, well, first and foremost, I was, I was such a huge fan of, of Margaret and we'd been like friendly and we'd hung out before and, you know, I, I love her. So I love you. I love you, period, end of story. Um, so when it was the one-two punch of Brett, who I also love, it was like Brett and Margaret being like, would you do this? I was like, I, I don't think I can say no, even though I was trepidatious about it because I've never done it before. And it's not, it's so, um, it's different from just, for just, from just composing music for like a record. I mean, this is like, it, it maybe I was naive. I don't know, but I wasn't really, I wasn't really thinking about it in that way. I was thinking about it more in like, yeah, man, like, why not? Like this, you know, I, to get to be a part of something with Margaret and again, it was just so special and I feel so blessed and honored to be a part of it. So one of the things that's so incredible about this show is that it's a story that deals with really heavy topics, you know, obviously domestic abuse and poverty and maddening government bureaucracy, but the show never feels didactic or preachy and it's often quite funny. It's, it's certainly very emotional as well, but it, it has all these lighter moments. So Molly, I'd love to start with you and just talk about how do you approach finding that balance tonally when you're looking at all these issues that the story deals with? Well, it was a big challenge because I, I knew early on that we were gonna be 10 hours and 10 episodes. And my goal off the bat was to take the audience through the journey of emotional abuse. So I knew we were going to leave with Alex and then go back with Alex and then leave again. And that journey of, you know, why didn't she leave? Why didn't I wanted to show you why she doesn't leave? And um, I, I knew it was going to really require the audience to love, love, love this character and really be rooting for her and see that this abuse happens to people who are smart and funny and intelligent. And it happens to, to women far and wide. So I think with me, the, the key to get everyone to go on the journey so they didn't check out or decide that this was broccoli or it was school, you know, the key was to keep us on her side and uh, in her point of view. And I think her beautiful coping mechanism is her sense of humor. Um, and so, yeah, it was just instrumental sort of in how we told the story is just being with her. And then we cast Margaret, which, you know, she's so delightfully wacky with stuff too. Like she made things funnier that weren't <laughs> like, because we all felt that need to have life and levity in this piece. Can I just tack on to that and say, I was so grateful for that because, you know, although we all love a nasty person on screen, more importantly is to see someone who is whole. Mm -hmm. And we got to episode eight and Q was directing episode eight and she was like, Anika, just go for it. Just do, just take it, just be what you wanna be. And I was like, silly. <laughs> <laughs> and it allowed me to take this character who had been so straight lined and just take her to the side. And I feel like that's so important because then you get to know somebody on a cellular level um, as opposed to just one space of who they are. And that's one of the things that makes her Regina but also makes this show a real thing and something that people feel like they can touch and people that they feel like they know. Um, and it's such a smart thing to be like, oh no, people actually need to breathe while they're watching this. So other things need to happen. You cannot turn on the TV and be like, Aah! the whole time. So <laughs> it was a really brilliant thing from you, Molly, to think of that from jump, from cue to be like, hey, let's just play. And, and I'm really grateful for that. And I'm sure everyone watching was also grateful to have moments where they could be like, oh, look, it's a mermaid doll, let's, let's chuckle. Um, that's good. <laughs> well, as a, you know, as a viewer, I feel like I really learned so much, you know, not just about, even just the idea that a, a character like Alex wouldn't realize she was in an abusive relationship, even though she clearly was. And I felt like I learned about 
so many answers to the questions of why don't why didn't she leave that kind of thing and so i'm wondering for for you guys for people who worked on the show how familiar were you with how versed were you in these worlds and and how did working on made change your outlook about you know both domestic violence but also just how women are you know the obstacles they they face um margaret do you want to start Um, okay. But, um, I think, I think one of the greatest parts about doing something, a, a mini series or something where you have the opportunity to be with the character for a very long time, um, is that like, undoubtedly the person that you are when you begin the project is different from the person you are when you finish it. And, um, like whatever you have to offer it in the beginning is, is a completely different thing than what you're offering at the end and and also um those things are intrinsically connected in that like it's having an effect on you um and um while like you know i'm coming from a place of that's privilege and my experiences are have been nothing like alex's thank god um i i think that i think that a lot of people are put into positions where um, someone in else is holding the power and making them question their own reality and, uh, and, and the way that they're perceiving the world and their feelings. And I think that um, it was just like, it was pretty incredible to me for me to experience things with Alex. And, you know, I, I, I only had the first four scripts when I started and I had no idea where it was going really. And, um, I feel like I learned so much by walking through it with her. Um, so thank you guys. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Um, I, I think um, for for me as a as a composer as a musician as a songwriter um, watching um, each episode every week when when we were sitting in the studio composing I found myself um, I found myself feeling really triggered and emotional I I wrote my first record you know, I, my first record came out in 2013 and there's a song on the record called Go Slow that talks about um, an emotionally abusive relationship that I had. And um, it was really, really detrimental to my mental health. And um, I think watching the show every week, I found myself having to take a minute and go outside and compose myself as the composer. Um, and um, it was really, um, it, was, it was challenging for me in that way. Um, but I also, I knew that because I was getting so emotionally charged by it, that it was an important story to tell. So I, throughout the process, I felt a lot of, you know, a, a lot of pressure to rise to the occasion and really make sure that I was doing the best job possible of really, um, capturing especially Alex's emotional journey um, simply because I felt so connected to her and her struggle and her um, her situation. So I also have to thank Molly uh, for, for creating such an amazing show that really um, raises awareness um, for such a pervasive issue. And I think every woman on this panel has either experienced something like that or knows someone that's experienced something like this. So it's such an important story to tell. And, you know, I think that, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I think that everyone on this call did a very good job of um, really, you know, capturing what that, you know, experience and, and feeling is. So I want to talk about a couple of pivotal episodes. Um, Lila, you directed five, episode five, Thief, in which Alex cleans the home of a 
criminal who was clearly abused as a child, and this leads to a really sort of devastating revelation about abuse in her own childhood. Um, I'd love to know, just as a director, how do you approach sort of that moment in the crawl space when Alex has this sudden memory, and it's in a tiny little space? <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess by way of context, I would say that that um, that moment in that episode and the kind of sequence it begins uh, contains a kind of coalescing and culmination of a set of threads that operate in that episode and are an extension of the foundation of the episodes that proceed. Um, there is, um, there's a kind of haunting in that episode, um, a kind of haunting of recognition that is percolating and operating for Alex as she's cleaning this house. Um, it is a feeling of recognition that she does not initially fully understand. It's operating at an unconscious level that the episode is going to um, excavate. And then there is also a kind of infection in the episode, <laughs> a virus. Maddie is sick and she's sick because there's black mold um, in the walls um, behind the plaster, <laughs> behind the paint and uh, in the apartment they're living in. And um, that mold um, has to be excavated. <laughs> it has to be uncovered. Um, uh, so the episode is grappling with um, that which lies underneath um, a sickness, a poison, a trauma that needs to be unearthed. And so um, I think it is not incidental at the level of the writing and the kind of visual conception of the episode on the page that um, the uh, revelation and recognition of that repressed memory and trauma um, occurs when Alex chooses to crawl behind the walls. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, that she first gets kind of stuck in that space um, and it triggers a, a panic attack. Margaret and Molly and I were just talking about this moment um, in a separate conversation. And, you know, Denise says in the epi episode, a panic attack can be the body's way of telling you it knows something. Um, uh, so she has a feeling that she knows something. And in fact, out of that panic attack, she first thinks I have to find my mother. Um, and Paul has been sort of missing. So she has a feeling that she knows something, um, but has to get closer to what's at the heart of the feeling. Um, and so in this final sequence, uh, she chooses to effectively, you could say, um, trigger herself, <laughs> um, to find that which is underneath in her, um, uh, so I guess that's all set up, which is to say, then we go in the crawl space and um, I want to exploit this opportunity to recognize another woman uh, on this project who's not on this call, who is your production designer, Renee Reed, uh, who um, I thought did a kind of unbelievable job, I think, now that I've watched the whole series of, of making characters out of each of the homes that Alex cleans, as they are for Alex. Um, her ability to kind of personify and design, I, I think, is just utterly remarkable. And um, uh, she did that with that house. And likewise, Q, I'm so happy to meet you um, through this medium <laughs> to just acknowledge what a gift the visual language that Q conceived of for the show equipped us with. I didn't shoot with Q, I shot with a wonderful DP named Vincent DePaula, but we inherited from Q as she described a, a visual language that was so deeply invested in subjectivity and proximity and intimacy. Um, and that equipped us to both, I hope, visually grapple with the kind of haunted uncanny in that house, um, which is, of course, an expression of an interior experience in Alex made manifest physically, spatially, and thus hopefully visually. And then, of course, when we got into that crawl space, just as Q described earlier with the question of 12 inches, um, <laughs> you know, it was vital to um, get in there. And, um, you know, I, I I think, um, you know, with regard to shooting it, I, I would just say that um, those tools equipped us visually, what Q gave us, what Renee gave us, 
um, and also what we were sort of given the freedom to do durationally because how you deal with time, right, also um, gets at the way that um, internal tension is felt and accumulates. And um, then I would just say that, of course, everything is Margaret. Um, <laughs> I mean, it begins with the writing and then it's Margaret and her face. So, and her soul, <laughs> candidly. So um, I think, you know, there was really, um, it's an odd way, I think, to put it. But for me, at least, there was great pleasure and great joy in excavating some of the more painful areas in this episode with a collaborator as courageous and game and brave and curious curious as Margaret is, don't cover your face, let us see your face, <laughs> um, uh, you know, because, um, you know, I think um, uh, by that point in our shoot and by that point in your shoot in the trajectory of the work you were doing in the episode, because you guys were able to shoot mostly sequentially. Um, the, the foundations were there to allow the two of us, I think, together in a small space, literally, and literally, um, to, um, to just try to um, uh, activate what was on your insides. Um, you know, that was the hope. Love you, Lila. <laughs> and to, uh, you directed episode eight, as we mentioned before, and I would, you know, love to talk about that scene that Molly mentioned, uh, you know, in this episode, Bear Hunt, Alex suffers a series of setbacks. She winds up with her abusive ex, Sean, and the episode ends with her lying on the couch and the couch swallows her. It literally swallows her and it's just, you know, so evocative. Can you talk about, you know, seeing that on the page and then how you bring that to life? Yeah, um, you know, I, when I read stories in scripts, I, because I come from the visual arts background, I, I can see it in my, in my mind's eye and this was tricky because it could have gone really hokey if not treated correctly. And so when in the script it says, and the couch swallows her whole, it's kind of like when you read a script and it said, and the the battle ensues. Okay, you can do whatever you want. It's like, you can do it however you want. It's like, yeah, it's one line, but it takes maybe 12 days to shoot that battle. So this was my battle because I didn't want it to feel like we we're departing too much from the visual language that we had set up, you know, in the first seven episodes preceding, but I also want it to feel very emotional and everything when I, you know, I, I don't see words as much as I see images and emotion. And so we wanted to really capture what that dissociation and being at the bottom of a pit literally would feel like. And that would be, being swallowed by a couch. But how did we achieve that? You know, again, like Lila, thank you Lila for your kind words earlier. Um, Renee Reed and I worked for maybe three weeks solid to create that couch. And we had an amazing stunt woman um, who was part of the team as well. So knowing that Margaret is so graceful and, and so in control of her limbs, I knew that it would at least be elegant and so, and I did know that I wanted to do a, a top, well, first I, I designed the whole sequence like with the, her falling over, seeing Sean come back um, with the six pack, you know, after having not had a drink for that long. Um, so having that in the foreground and she's clock set and then seeing her daughter kind of like, but not seeing her daughter. So all that was part of the beginning of the dissociation and, and having that out of body experience. Um, so what we did was we designed a couch that would basically, she would slip through the, the seam between the cushions in a way that uh, didn't collapse the couch. And that was really important. I also didn't want any bounce back of the cushions popping back because that would take you out of the reality. And so having it look as organic as possible would create that very visceral um, emotion. So Margaret was, um, wearing a, um, like a, she had two pick points on her with cables and we built this on stage, which would match to the practical location. Um, and so basically she slid into the couch and out the back of a wall that was a, a fake wall and there's a pocket down there. And I also knew I wanted her POV again, maintaining that perspective was incre incredibly important. So I had 
the floor drop out so that I could put the camera here to slide underneath the couch as well, which represent her POV. And at the beginning of the episode, I also had her looking up at the, at the ceiling and having her world turn upside down. So basically the episode's book ended by this camera movement, which is basically her world, you know, writing itself up and then going back upside down. Like what did, what happened the previous night in episode seven? Um, but really it was about um, staying true to the emotion of, of, of losing oneself and one's self worth. And at that moment, she feels completely at an utter loss, um, nowhere to go, you know, she's broke. Um, uh, I, I do actually wanna bring up one thing that happens right before that is, um, you know, this show is about emotional abuse, which is abuse. And that's something that I learned um, in answering to something that you asked earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I did a show about sexual assault earlier, um, of Unbelievable, which is, you know, where we also explored dissociation. But this is different because the emotional abuse is sometimes, I don't want to say like, it's harder to pinpoint, right? Because there's no, like, like Alex says in the first episode, well, what, that he didn't hit me? Like, there's no signs of that. And that's why it's so hard to, to recognize and to identify. Um, it was really important in the scene preceding the couch scene where Sean slams her against the wall, that it not get to that point, that it not get to the physical abuse part. And that was something that Molly and I, and, and, and Margaret and I discussed, and Nick as well, Nick Robinson, who plays Sean, we discussed that for like so long. Do you remember that? We had conversations before we even shot that scene. We we're like, okay, we want to make sure that he, he doesn't hit her. But then at the same time, Margaret was like, you know, down for anything. And so she was like, no, no just, just slam me against the wall. But her reaction to that was something that I knew was going to be like, okay, we have to get this from a camera perspective and from an emotional, like, I, I don't want to put Margaret through this more than once. It's going to be really intense. And I don't know if you remember Mark, like I let the camera roll actually for five minutes after that. We only did it once. We did it once. And I let the camera roll because I said, right before we went, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna cut. You just do what you gotta do. It, we're gonna let it roll and I don't wanna interrupt it because you know, what do you do after that? What you do is you go back to the same routine. And right before that moment, she had been about to make a pot of coffee. And so after she falls down and, and I, I remember on, on set, we were all crying because <laughs> it was so powerful. You know, you're so in the moment. Um, when she falls to the ground on her knees and says, I'm so stupid, I'm so stupid. That's when I was like, uh, I don't, I, I'm like, do I cut and give her a hug? No, I don't want to do that. Let's just let it roll. She's going to go back and she gets up, she composes herself and she goes back to making coffee. And that to me, that moment, knowing that happened is so profound yeah. because you don't, you know, as a victim of emotional abuse, you just, it's a cycle of endless violence. And so to me, like going back to making the coffee was just as routine as anything else. Okay. What else am I going to do? Right. I was making coffee and I let the camera roll. And that was like, oh my God, like to me, that just gave me the chills. And I was like, I, this is what it means to be emotionally abused. Um, but, but, you know, really trying to stay true to that and, and depicting that emotion of being swallowed in the most realistic visceral way was, was really a goal. And with the aid of Renee Reed and our stunt coordinator um, and with, with, with Margaret's grace, I think we um, were able to achieve that. So. Yeah, and it's incredible to hear that all uh, explained out, and it makes it even more powerful to think about all the the really in, intense detail that went into crafting uh, that scene. Um, we're going to wrap in just a minute, but I would love um, to talk quickly, Margaret and Esty. I understand you guys recorded a song together for yeah, yeah we did. Tell us about it. Our well, record's that... coming out next year. Our full length. Our full length <laughs> record is coming out next year. <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, no, I mean, I, again, I'm such a, I just wanted to hang out with Margaret and I wanted to, I heard that she had written, you know, some really powerful, you know, lyrics. And I was like, let's get in the studio. And we picked a time and, you know, she came into the studio and, you know, we were kind of just hanging out and I was plunking out some chords 
And then Margaret just started singing this song. And I was like, I was like, okay, 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 wait, 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 okay, wait. I'm just gonna record. I'm just gonna record. I'm just gonna record. Like, just do exactly what you just did. Just sing it the way that you just did. And I'm gonna pluck out these chords. Go. I love you, Esty. Oh, <laughs> dude, I love you. Um, uh, and it was just, I mean, again, like I, I, I work with my sisters and being able to work with Margaret felt so not only familiar, but also familial. So like being able to do something with Margaret that didn't have anything to do again with my, my sisters was just, it felt really natural and it was really, really fun to just hang out and like make a song with my friend. That's and great. the lyrics were so powerful and so brilliant. And again, I walked away being like, is there anything she can't do? It was almost like frustrating. Oh. I was like, what? <laughs> it was like, that's kind of not fair. <laughs> um, but again, like it was really fun and I would do it. I would do a whole record with Margaret if I could. <laughs> we'll spare the world. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I mean, I had a great time again, like <laughs> the, the pandemic's not over. I'm, I'm still technically, I'm not on tour yet. I got some time. And I just want to wrap with uh, Andy. I just wanted to talk to you quickly about episode eight as well. That's a great episode for Paula in that she, she ends up being hospitalized after having a mental health breakdown and she feels real, real resentment toward Alex. How did you approach that and what what were it was very different from the other things you did in the in the series so how was that to play um yeah you know the opening scene where you see Paula she has such pressured speech and that is symptomatic of bipolar so you see her so so many times in a manic um uh, uh, way that it was you know it was nice to be able to see her come come down you know, because you saw her manically high so much and you have, it, you're very conscious of her hypersexuality, which is another symptom of, of bipolar. And, um, you know, one thing I will say, I think it's also interesting that she's so manipulate, she's easy to manipulate because of her illness. And people don't realize that the reason she's acting the way she's acting is all due to being sick. And you don't really understand the depth of her illness, I think, until eight. And that's why I like episode eight so much is she is humorous. She's funny. And she's also the life of the party, even though everything that you're seeing, all her behaviors that make her the life of the party are her illness. And um, so it's very easy to get lost on all those symptoms and not see what's underneath underneath it, which is really a very ill person, someone who's really super suffering, who's suffering very deeply. And that's what I liked about eight, because you finally see it. And she and I love the episode. I love that scene with her daughter because she rec she realizes that her daughters put her away. And you see so much in that scene because you see her being her comic self. You see her being uh, you know, her, her sort of manic over the top kind of behavior and her recognizing what her daughter has done so it's a big trip for her and then finally she shuts up <laughs> which was a relief for me because i i don't know some of the for me i really like quiet acting this was not an easy role for me i like i like to be quiet i like all everything that happens when you're not speaking and i never had that opportunity until eight well i could talk to you ladies all day, but I know that we have to wrap. So I just want to say thank you so much uh, for sharing your stories with us and congratulations again on this incredible series. And uh, if you haven't watched it yet out there, you know, what are you waiting for? Go stream Made on Netflix. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.